Hey guys, Chaps here, and I just wanted to share a recap of A Fear Arising. It's the new Gears novel that just came out last week, and it's the first one written by Michael Stackpole. I know not everyone is a big reader, so I figured I'd take some time and highlight the main points. I guess it's a TLDR type thing. And yeah, obviously this has spoilers, so be warned. This is by no means comprehensive, but hopefully this catches you up on everything you missed. As some background, A Fear Arising takes place shortly after Gears 3. Within a few months, humanity is rebuilding, and people are trying to figure out what the future holds. Act 1 of the book starts with Marcus and Anya moving into the Stroud estate. It's pretty clear early on that many aren't too fond of Gears, but the Stroud family was well respected. I guess they were pretty important in the town during pre-war times. Marcus is really struggling to adapt to civilian life. He feels naked without his armor and weapons, and is always alert and on edge, and always assessing contingency plans. Anya gets invited to a banquet or a reception, and obviously by relationship, Marcus tags along as well. There's a lot of old wealth here, people who were well off before the war, and seemingly still doing better off than many of the commoners. Here we see some familiar faces, Hoffman basically just there helping with some networking, and Aaron Griffin is there representing Char, apparently he's still running that town. And we also get to see some new characters. I won't go into all of the details or all of the new people, but some of the main ones are Jamila Shin, the host of the banquet, Raoul Hesterworth, Hesterworth, I don't know how to say it, one of the leaders of Saradine Industries. They manufactured lancers and have some information infrastructure, and are basically an economic powerhouse. And Brandon Terrell, who at this time we don't really know too much about. He introduced himself to Marcus, and they had a decent conversation. Marcus still isn't sure what to think, though. Jamila pulled Anya aside for some discussion. She wants to begin some efforts to rebuild. It's clear that Jamila is taking a leadership role, but wants Anya there as her right hand. Basically, Anya's years of work for the COG have made her a great leader and decision maker. Anya doesn't want to be a politician, but is all in for helping rebuild civilization. In their first meeting, they identify a sanitation plant that needs some repair. There they can work water and sewage, and even start an algae and eventually fish farms for food. For this, Anya calls in Baird to help. This is also where they come up with the name of the Ministry, and the leaders being called the Ministers, and the top person being the First Minister, being the first among equals. They're trying to be really careful to avoid anything totalitarian or anything resembling the COG. While this is going on, Marcus is adjusting to being a stay-at-home husband, and Actually, I don't know if they're actually married, and like, are there rules and regulations around that? There's no formal government anymore, so there's not really any legal regulations. But anyways, he's learning to cook, fixing things around the house, trying to start up some farming, and walking around learning the lay of the land while looking for places to trade. Oh, there's also a lot of pillow talk and mushy conversations between Marcus and Anya. I guess it's sort of expected, but it's hard to picture Marcus saying and doing some of these things. It's such the polar opposite from the Marcus that we've come to know. This continues throughout the book, and honestly, it never really starts feeling normal. One day, Brandon stops by to see Marcus. He travels a lot, and has heard many tales about locust sightings. They're pretty sure the stories aren't real, but they want to investigate. Better safe than sorry, I guess. Also, by having Marcus, a gear, go with him, it will give more credibility to the fact that they're gone, and he knows what to look for. And I guess if worse comes to worse, and there are locusts, having a gear wouldn't hurt. Moving on to Act 2, the chapters now mostly alternate between Marcus and Anya. Anya staying in Afira, and Marcus now leaving with Brandon to go search for the Locus. Anya goes to the first town hall meeting. There, she finds that many people aren't too trusting of her being a former COG soldier. At the same time, she's not very trusting of the people that she's met. Many of them are probably making power plays, and a lot of them are concerned over the division of wealth and wanting to ensure that their status returns to that of pre-war conditions. During this time, Baird has been busy at work. He's fixed up most of the water and sewage stuff. He even modified a jackpot to make the first DB prototype. The plan for them is to perform menial tasks to assist with construction of new homes and buildings. She also lays out the plans for DB Industries. Basically, he's willing to donate a ton of time to help get things running, but he's securing some benefits for himself in the long run. Marcus and Brandon make it to Hanover, where we find out that Cole is running the show. The town seems in decent shape, and Cole is even looking to start up a thrashball league. Next, they visit Mercy and Dom's grave, and as they're traveling, they find a boy who's clearly been abused, and then a locust attacks. And yeah, a legit locust drone. Apparently the ICM didn't actually kill all of them. Marcus quickly kills the lone drone, but then he gets attacked. Turns out by a human. Brandon takes care of this guy though, and they're good to go. Turns out that there's a slave trader running a small group nearby, and this drone was used by them, sort of like a dog. They take over the camp and bring the traders back to Cole so that they can be punished. They also get a lead on where to go next. This happens to be towards a town called Harkness Glen. It's a very self-sufficient town that almost sounds like a utopia or a cult, but without the brainwashing and stuff. 
The foundation of the town kept it safe from locusts during the war, so most of the citizens have never actually seen a locust. There's a fancy dinner that night, and Brandon and Marcus attend in the main clubhouse, and then suddenly, another locust drone dives in and attacks. Act 3 opens with the locust attacking. In all, I think there were three locust drones that attacked and were put down, but not without a few civilian casualties. Marcus notes that these locusts seem smaller and weaker than the ones he's used to. It's almost like they were juveniles or just malnutritioned. Once the town is secure, Marcus and Brandon head off to follow the locust tracks. They're also joined by Kamira Razik, the leader of Harkness Glen, and Isadora, one of her assistants. And yeah, I'm sorry if I'm butchering these names, I am terrible pronunciation. Anyways, they keep going, they find a town, and they get a new lead. Oh, and there's some kid named Nick there who asks Marcus to find a sister for him. They travel off and find a farm with some dead people, clearly the work of locusts, and they quickly come to some conclusion. It's explained a bit, but it's sort of grasping at straws. Anyway, the conclusion is that Ceridine was monitoring power and knew that a decent sized family was here. They then used drones to come in and clear out the main threats, i.e. the adult males, and then the women and children were taken away for slave trading and breeding. I'll also mention that they found more signs that the drones had some sort of collar or tech attached to them that they think may allow someone to control it somewhat. With things now picking up and them knowing that there's clearly a bigger picture going on, they called in some reinforcements. Baird, Sam, Clayton Carmine, and Cole arrived, coming in a Hanover's Cougar painted raven that also brought some supplies. Cutting back to Anya for a bit, due to some structural integrity issues, Anya and Baird proposed that they scrap the idea of rebuilding Ephira and instead make a new town, New Ephira, which would be out near the processing plant that they're currently using. Griffin also has some discussions with Anya. Going in, he's a bit hostile and untrusting, but leaving, it seems like they're on the same page and much more trusting of each other. Anya continues to be annoyed about people discussing economics and restoring old wealth, and she's even more concerned about Ceridine making some power plays via the communication and information network that they're setting up. Marcus, Baird, Cole, Clayton, Sam, Brandon, Kamira, Isadora, like that whole group, they all discover a mining camp. It appears to be run by Ceridine, and they appear to have pet locusts going around the camp as guard dogs. At this time, Jamila is letting Anya know that she's been blackmailed and must drop out of the running for first minister. Hasterworth, Hesterworth, whatever, follows up in a meeting with Anya, and once he confirms that she doesn't want to be first minister, he asks for her endorsement. He explains his plan in which he'll set up a system of makers and takers with various levels of settlements. In a phone call, Anya explains this to Marcus, and then it dawns on him that part of this camp that they found is actually a test settlement, and clearly a proof of concept for Ceridine. They want to train locusts to attack periodically so that there's fear in the community, and only Ceridine can keep them safe. Suddenly, things start to change as the camp starts to move around like they're trying to destroy the evidence. Marcus and the gang launch an attack, and they secure a tent with various scientists, and then the battle breaks out before everything is finally secured. In the scientist's tent, they find a few locusts being experimented on, including a boomer, and Baird starts collecting evidence to bring back. The scientists claim that they didn't know the true intentions of what was going on, and they also claim that the locusts were slowly dying from the aftermath of the ICM. They found treatments, but without being administered occasionally, they'll eventually die. To me, that says that as long as people stop treating the locusts, they should all die. In theory, that is. So after all this wraps up and everyone returns back to Ephira, there's a new town hall meeting. This is supposed to be where they vote for First Minister. Instead, Anya drops the bombshell about there still being locusts, but they believe that they've killed them all now. Hesterworth goes on some spiel about dropping out, but it's unrelated to the locusts, and it's kind of confusing as Anya never really accused him. But it turns out that she had in fact visited him the day prior. She bluffed a bit about how much evidence they had, and essentially blackmailed him into backing out of the running and turning over the information systems part of Ceridine to the Ministry. They never ended up having a vote for First Minister, but with the main competition now removed, it's pretty obvious that Anya would win. Which obviously she does if you paid attention in-game. And it's worth mentioning that Marcus did in fact find Nick's sister at that camp and help them reunite. And the two kids are now moving into the Stroud estate with Marcus and Anya. Oh, and Nick's full name is Dominic, so I guess that's fitting. And that really does it for this book. I actually really enjoyed this one, much more so than the previous two. There was a lot of political discussion and concepts around how to rebuild civilization. There was also plenty of interpersonal interactions and not just a bunch of tactics and running around and shooting. Those are things I want to play in-game. This book got it right by letting us read about the stuff that wouldn't make for good gameplay, but really helps fill out the lore. As I said before, I've glossed over most of the details. If you have questions, feel free to ask them, and I'll do my best to get you an answer. If you enjoyed this or found it helpful, please consider dropping it a like or subscribing. Thanks for watching everyone, and I will catch you next time.